Hello, 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 hello. There are still a number of seats uh, down in front. This event was sold out, but not oversold. So if you'd like to be on the next flight, we can't help you. Um, but I just want to make sure everybody has uh, seats. If there's a seat near you, would you, would you raise your hand, uh, stand, and just sing a song if you don't mind. Just, uh, all right. All right, well, why don't we, yeah, there's seats here. All right, well, I'm going to leave it to you. But uh, let me then officially say, welcome to Socrates in the City. Thank you for coming. As you can see, are you, are you George Gilder? We've been expecting you. How are you, George? Now, you know you're not speaking this evening. But you're going to be speaking soon, very soon. Uh, there's a seat here for you, if you, don't, uh, if you don't mind. Nobody's looking at you. Don't worry. That's, that's the George Gilder. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, as I hope you know, uh, I am uh, thrilled about this evening for many reasons, not least because we are sold out. Uh, I do have to say that, uh, you know, to, to be sold out uh, is always uh, a good thing. Uh, and I don't mean that you're, you know, sellouts. I mean that we're, you, you understand what I mean? It's not like when Billy Joel did uh, Uptown Girl kind of sellout, right? It's, it's a good kind of sellout. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, all right, so I guess that's just a warning that if you're registering for Socrates, we actually do sell out. We're not, we're not kidding. Um, well, if you cannot come to Socrates in the city, as you can see by the thousands of cameras, uh, we're doing our best to film all of these in HD uh, and put them on the web as soon as we can get them edited. Are the editors in the room? No pressure. But as soon as we get them edited, we get them on the web, and, and we want to get these wonderful uh, conversations um, out to as wide an audience as possible. Um, speaking of, of who is in the room, actually, George Gilder uh, just announced himself. And, um, and uh, we have uh, my friend Jay Richards is here also. These are, in my mind, future Socrates in the City speakers. Uh, I hope that they can afford I hope they can afford to accept our extraordinarily uh, low honorarium, um, but uh, in, in any case. But I, I have to say, uh, speaking of who is in the room, um, we, we have one of the most brilliant authors uh, of recent decades. I know you're all thinking I'm talking about myself. I'm not. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, put myself in that category publicly. Um, but, uh, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say who it is, of course, uh, but I will, give you, I will give you his initials. I can say his initials. They're Tom Wolf. You know, you know Tom Wolf? The man in the white suit seated right here. I hope, uh, yeah. When you become a, an icon, people will embarrass you. There's just nothing you can do about it. It's tough. Um, uh, I, I, when I heard that Tom Wolfe was going to be here, I immediately, I got nervous, I immediately ran out and, and bought a bespoke suit for the evening. Um, and it was very expensive, but obviously I'm going to return it tomorrow. Uh, honestly, before I, I talk about Stephen Meyer, who is our very special uh, guest for the evening, I just had to say one more thing about Tom Wolfe. And I just said this to him, and he doesn't mind, I hope. He, didn't, he pretended not to mind. But... Uh, he wrote a book. He's written many books, obviously, many huge books. The Right Stuff, Bonfire, The Vanities, Don't Applaud. He's very shy. Um, but there's a teensy-weensy book that he wrote called The Painted Word, which I had the great, great joy of reading a number of years ago. And it's, it's less than 100 pages. It is, like most of his stuff, just ridiculously entertaining. But what it does is it nails, I mean kills, uh, dissects the world of modern art so spectacularly brilliantly that there's really nothing more to be said ever on that subject. Uh, I, I, when I found out that he was going to be here, I, I found nine copies of the book so that those of you who sprint to the book table can get that and maybe he'll sign it for you. But if you can't get one of those nine copies, honestly, it is just ridiculously wonderful. And it's also, I would say, uh, definitive, as I think I said a moment ago, in, in what it says. It's just, you'll read it, you'll know what I mean. You'll never go to MoMA again. Yes, I'm looking at you. And um, it is, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So thank you for allowing me to embarrass you, sir. Um, 
All right, it's, you can open your eyes now, it's over. Uh, I, I want to, and before I uh, talk about Steve, I want to thank um, the Discovery Institute and, and especially the McClellan Foundation for making this evening possible. Uh, as I've said over and over again, uh, it's not easy for us to do these events. They're expensive. A number of you have been uh, generous with us over the years, and this time I do want to acknowledge uh, the folks at McClellan uh, and uh, Charlie Phillips for just uh, making this possible. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Well, and now to the, uh, to the man of the hour, the man of the week, <clears throat> Mr. Rich Little. No, uh, I almost said Mr. Stephen Meyer. I have trouble with the, with the Mr. and Doctor. The other day, this is not a joke, uh, I meant to say Doctor Who, and I said Mr. Who. Uh, it's the less successful brother of Doctor Who. I looked it up <laughs> on the internet. But um, no, tonight our special guest, very special guest, is Dr. Uh, Stephen Meyer. Um, if you didn't know, uh, he is one of the founders uh, of the so-called intelligent design movement. So we know that he's terribly brilliant, but uh, you may also know that he's terribly brave um, because the ID movement has, by its very existence, threatened many of the most beloved tenets of the powerful scientific establishment. And those in that powerfully entrenched establishment have taken every opportunity to try and strangle this baby in the cradle, so to speak, but they have not succeeded. Uh, indeed, the baby uh, in the cradle managed to get out of the cradle and first crawled, then walked, and is now, in fact, running hither and yon, merrily spreading havoc and fear amongst ideologically calcified materialists everywhere. <laughs> uh, and of course, we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, but what exactly is the ID movement? Uh, well, I'll ask. Stephen Meyer in just a moment. Um, in the meantime, let me tell you about him. He graduated from Whitworth College in Spokane. Is that said Spokane, Washington? Did I get that right? Thank you. Uh, with a degree in physics and earth science and worked for an oil company as a geophysicist. Uh, his bio says he worked in seismic survey interpretation. But at one time or another, haven't we all done that? <laughs> I would say most of us in the room have worked in that at one time or another. Not a big deal. Um, but then he got a huge scholarship uh, to get a PhD at Cambridge University in the history and philosophy of science. Uh, and this is no joke, that extraordinary and life-changing scholarship uh, was awarded to him by the Rotary Club. That is true, right? I'm not just playing that for laughs. No, not the Shriners. I heard somebody say that. Uh, here, the Shriners, of course, typically send their people to Oxford. That's just, uh, this, it's their tradition. Yeah. So um, Dr. Meyer's thesis at Cambridge um, offered a methodological interpretation of origin of life research. And well, of course, after that, he was off to the races. Here we are. Uh, he founded the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in 2002 and is now, among other things, their director. Some of you know uh, Dr. Meyer's previous book, Signature in the Cell, abbreviated S-I-T-C, and I will sue you. Um, oh, I will, yeah. I, the thing in the New Testament about not suing the brethren, that's, that's, I'm a dispensationalist that ended, uh, that ended when John died, I think. And so I'm free to sue you, and I, and I will sue you. Um, in any case, in the book Signature in the Cell, um, he examined the mystery of the origin of life. Uh, that book was named one of the top books of 2009 by the Times Literary Supplement of London, which I would say is about as staggering a mainstream endorsement as one is likely to come by. Uh, it's almost as if uh, Danny DeVito or Cher had praised the book. Uh, it's, that, it's that big. It's that mainstream. Um, of course, other brave souls in academia and elsewhere gave it tremendously good reviews. Uh, and, of course, was very controversial. Um, Dr. Thomas Nagel, professor at NYU, praised it effusively and called it a careful presentation of a fiendishly difficult problem. For his honesty, uh, Dr. Nagel was widely excoriated by the scientific establishment. And I think since Dr. Nagel is at NYU, uh, we ought to invite him to speak at Socrates in the city. I think we'll enjoy that. So perhaps somebody can give me his information. Uh, but very brave to do for an NYU professor, I think. Um, 
Dr. Meyer's latest book, and the one we'll focus on this evening, is, of course, titled Darwin's Doubt, which has already been a New York Times bestseller. And again, brave souls in the academic world have stepped up to offer it high praise. Dr. Mark Miniman, paleontologist at Mount Holyoke, writes, it's hard for us paleontologists to admit that neo-Darwinian explanations for the Cambrian explosion have failed miserably. Uh, Meyer describes the dimensions of the problem with clarity and precision. His book is a game changer. Uh, Dr. George Church, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, writes, is that a typo? Harvard Medical School, really? <laughs> what's, he, what's he doing now? Uh, he, he wrote uh, that Darwin's doubt represents an opportunity for bridge building rather than dismissive polarization, bridges across cultural divides in great need of professional, respectful dialogue, and bridges to span evolutionary gaps. And I might add, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so for our format tonight, um, I will interview Dr. Meyer for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have uh, some time for Q&A. That's where you come in. I hope we'll have microphones uh, set up here. Before I bring him up, I should say that in 2008, um, Dr. Meyer famously appeared with Ben Stein in the documentary Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Some of you may know that, um, know him from that. He's also been widely featured on innumerable uh, TV programs all over the spectrum, and you may have seen his most recent appearance on The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. Um, <laughs> how about a warm Socrates in the City welcome for Dr. Stephen Meyer? Man, ridiculous. In your words, and it's kind of funny to ask the founder of something, what, what does intelligent design, the movement, mean? Well, the theory of intelligent design is the idea that there are certain features of life and the universe that are best explained by a purposive intelligence rather than an undirected material process, such as in the realm of biology, natural selection acting on random mutations. Now, that's a mouthful. It's a kind of a definition, but I can unpack that a little bit. And one way to do that is to contrast intelligent design with that specific meaning of evolution that the theory was designed to challenge. Okay. There are three meanings of evolution, three basic meanings. One is change over time. And that can refer to the fact that life is different now than it was a long time ago. We do not have the T-Rex running down Fifth Avenue. Uh, we don't have trilobites uh, out in the Atlantic Ocean. Things, things are different now than they used to be. That change over time concept can also refer to the observable, modest changes that we see taking place in the structure of organisms, the famous Galapagos finches. When the weather patterns changed in the Galapagos a while back, it's documented that the, uh, the, the birds with uh, uh, slightly longer beaks did better than the ones with shorter beaks, mm -hmm. so you got a cyclical variation in the shape and, and, and size of beaks. So that's also a, 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 an idea of change over time or evolution in that sense. Mm -hmm. And, and those, the, the, the meaning, the idea of change over time is not really contentious or disputed. Second meaning of evolution is the it, idea It would be disputed, disputed by almost among any young earth creationists. Well, possibly. You know, the, All right, they, they're, they're not allowed into this there, club anymore. Well, there would, there, there but, would be but, um, a, a question but, uh, of how, how long the time scale is involved in okay, the change that okay. has occurred. But the, but the basic idea, just so yeah. everybody's tracking, the basic idea of change over time, that life forms have changed over the... Uh, millennia, eons, is not generally disputed. Not generally disputed. And that uh, intelligent design... We're and, certainly not and, disputing and evolution And every kind of evolution right. would say that that happened. Right, exactly. Okay. Second meaning of evolution is the idea of common ancestry. And that can refer to uh, uh, universal common ancestry, the idea that all organisms are connected by what Darwin called descent from modification from this one single simple form simple primordial form way back when, or it could be a more limited thesis that certain groups of organisms are related by common ancestry. But the Darwinian idea was that the picture, the history of life is best represented as a, a, as a kind of tree of life. And he, he actually drew a tree in the origin to depict this, where the branches at the top of the tree represent all the forms of life that exist today. The trunk or the root of that tree represents that first primordial form, and the ones that only made it halfway up are the ones that got extinct. So it's a, it's a visual depiction of his idea about the, the history of life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and 
intelligent design is not challenging that either, although there are advocates of intelligent design who are skeptical about that. Right. And there, in fact, there are sci other scientists who are not. So, you, so you'd consider even common descent to be a theory, not necessarily. It's definitely true. a theory. It's, a theory. It, it's an attempt okay. to interpret certain facts that we have left okay. behind. Okay. And, and uh, certainly no one saw that whole history. Right. So it's a reconstruction right. based on the facts that are left behind. And it's one of many possible reconstructions. Um, but it's, it's not what intelligent design is challenging either. It, the intelligent design is challenging the third meaning of evolution. And that's the idea that there is an unguided, undirected process known as natural selection acting on random mutations that has produced all the forms of life we see, but also has produced the appearance of design that all biologists acknowledge, or nearly all biologists acknowledge. Richard Dawkins, the world's foremost spokesman for so-called neo-Darwinism, the modern textbook version of Darwin's theory, says that life is, uh, that, that biology, rather, is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. How clever of them. It's, <laughs> it is the counterintuitive nature of the Darwinian idea. Right. That things look, yes, they look designed, whether right. it's that beautiful structure of the coiled nautilus or those intricate molecular machines or the, uh, uh, the, 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 the chambered structure of the heart right. with all its, its uh, plumbing and, and wiring. Um, <clears throat> many, many things in biology look as though they were designed, but the idea is that they were produced by an undirected, unguided process that produced the appearance of design. Right. So they would say natural selection has the power to mimic the uh, natural selection mimics the powers of a designing right. intelligence, but it is not designed or guided in any way. Thus, the leading proponents of Darwinism will say that we have design without a designer. We have the appearance of design. Is that what it's called, blind Darwinism? Well, sometimes it's called the blind watchmaker hypothesis, okay. after the title of one of Dawkins' famous books. Okay. And so intelligent design is challenging that, and the, and the title, or the, the, the term intelligent design, was selected intelligently, if you will, to make clear which of those three meanings of evolution were challenging explicitly. Okay. We think things, that there are certain features of biological systems that were actually designed, and you can tell by examining the scientific evidence. Okay, so just to, so that everyone's tracking with you and so that I'm tracking with you, I'm going to repeat back to you what you just said. Sure. But not tonight. Not tonight. Um, <laughs> I, excuse me. Because, because I think that in the popular, um, well, popular culture, these distinctions are never clearly made. You would get the idea that there are two theories. One theory is that uh, we were created 11,000 years ago, and shazam, here we are. Uh, the other theory is the scientific theory that says everything happened uh, by random forces and that we evolved out of the primordial soup and here we are and there is absolutely no God involved in that process. But what you're saying now and uh, obviously what I've, I've read about is that there, there are so many variations between those two poles. And so intelligent design, as I understand it, is, um, says that yes, this happened. There were trilobites uh, four billion years ago and uh, things have, quote unquote, evolved, things have changed. Maybe I don't want to use the word evolved because it's a little bit loaded, but things have in fact changed. We can see this, uh, we can observe this in, in the fossil record, basically, uh, but uh, blind uh, Darwinists, neo-Darwinists would say there is no way that that could have been directed, there was no God involved in that process. They say that adamantly. No designer or intelligent agent okay, of any no kind. Okay, no agent. It right. was just utterly random, and it was something that... I, Eric, I prefer the term undirected or undirected. mindless. Okay, because... Uh, and... And, uh, and you, why? Well, b because you could have something that's random, that appears to be random mm -hmm. to us, that actually has a hidden hand behind it. And the, okay. the Darwinians insist that the appearance of design is an illusion. Now, right. if it's an illusion, it follows logically that the process that produced the appearance of design was not mindful. It was right. unguided and undirected. Right. And, and so that's the crucial tenet. And the, the, this idea is actually hard-baked into the logic of Darwinism. When you go to the third chapter of The Origin of Species, Darwin uses an interesting analogy to artificial uh, breeding experiments that you know ranchers and farmers have been doing from time immemorial, mm -hmm. where where uh, uh, an, uh, a farmer or rancher could choose a particular trait that he wanted to see maximized or enhanced. In the you might think of uh, sheep in the far north of Scotland, and if you want to get I a might. woolier breed of sheep, <laughs> you would uh, 
you would select the wooliest males and the wooliest females to breed. And Darwin, yes, would. and then generation <laughs> after generation, you'd, you'd get woolier and woolier sheep. And this is a well-known phenomenon. 19th century biologists knew, knew all about this. Darwin came along and said, well, what if you had a series of very cold winters such that all but the wooliest died out? Wouldn't you get the same effect? And so he, right. he proposed natural selection as an alternative to artificial selection, to intelligently driven selection. Right. So the mechanism was meant to exclude a designer in the very way he formulated the theory. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so that's been the big issue. Design okay. or no design. Right. Design or apparent design. Well, I guess what I find so fascinating by this, and one of the reasons I was so happy to get you to come here, is that it's ironic, I would say, at least ironic, that the scientific establishment today is as hidebound, in a way, and as I said earlier, cal calcified in their ideology, that they're not even willing to be slightly open to the possibility that there might be an intelligent force. Uh, and so they have been tremendously dismissive, as I understand it, of the intelligent design movement. I mean, <laughs> you've lived this. Why do you think that is? Well, I have a friendly debating colleague who is a Darwinist, Michael Ruse, who says that uh, he's written an important book in which he explains that Darwinism has functioned as something of a secular religion for many scientists. And many scientists, I think, uh, have had a difficulty distinguishing what you might call materialistic philosophy from the enterprise of science itself. Mm -hmm. So if you have a theory that has non-materialistic implications, or which challenges a theory that does have decidedly mm -hmm. materialistic implications, there's an implied threat to a deeper worldview or metaphysical understanding right. of reality. And I think all of us respond when our fundamental belief systems are challenged, right. sometimes with some passion so and So their zeal. objections are irrational and religious. I wouldn't say they're irrational, but I think that the level of, uh, of uh, response is, or the, the passion of the response is understandable from this, because of the, the big issues that are in play. Um, are you naturally this kind, or do you just realize that you, you, have, to, you have to be diplomatic? Um, I have to say, no, that it's, uh, the, more, the more I have looked at it, I've, I've been staggered by the, um, well, how do I put it, the, the, the lack of scientific rigor in that kind of thinking, or, or maybe well, just to say I, the lack of logic. I can give you a number of it. You know, some of the, the, the week my book was released, uh, the, it was released on this June, book. This most recent one, June 18th, earlier yeah. this summer. Uh, by 3 o'clock in the morning, there were about a dozen of these one-star hostile reviews, and some of the turns of phrase were just choice. Mendacious intellectual pornography. Right. Steaming pile of pseudoscience. That, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So, That's uh, great. By people who clearly had read the book very carefully. And, uh, yeah. you know, and so, right. the, the day after the book was released, there was a 9,400-word review on June 19th. Now, the book is 400 pages yeah. plus with notes and... And so you can, th th this is uh, struck a nerve. Yeah, yeah. There were people lying in wait, so. Well, uh, I'd say that's a compliment. Um, I think that the other thing that one hears, um, and also I have heard it, uh, is that this is not science. And, and, and what these people seem to do, and again, I, you don't have to take a position on what you believe, but the idea that, that they're so closed-minded that they would simply say it's not science, and are unwilling to discuss it. Um, I guess I wonder what they think science is, because if, if logic and evidence leads you to surmise that yes, perhaps there was uh, intelligence behind this, that there's design, it's, it's a logical and a scientific conclusion. Um, so to say that you, can't, you can conclude anything but that is, is just strange to me, and it seems to me that they have this idea that anything that kicks against, um, that shakes up this materialist right. ideology, right. really religion, right. is unacceptable. And so they say it's not science, and because most of these folks are part of the powerful uh, scientific establishment, they can, they can say that. So I guess I want to ask you, um, what to you, what, what is science to you? Well, this is part of what I, I studied in my dissertation years in Cambridge, that it turns out that there's a a lot of talk about the scientific method, but, but it turns out there are, there are actually many different scientific methods. And I studied very intentionally, uh, very consciously, the, the method that Darwin used in reconstructing the ancient past. 
uh, discussions of biological origins are, in the end, discussions of natural history. And there's a particular method of scientific reasoning that scientists use when they're trying to study events in the remote past. Mm -hmm. You can't make a trilobite reemerge under controlled laboratory conditions. So the kind of science that bench physicists or chemists do in the laboratory is not going to be applicable to studying mm -hmm. the ancient past. What Darwin did was pioneer essentially a method of forensic science where the clues that are left behind are used to reconstruct what happened in the ancient past. Mm -hmm. And he had an important rule of reasoning, which was that if you're trying to ex explain an event in the past, you want to invoke causes which are, as, he, as uh, his mentor Charles Lyell put it, now in operation. You want to invoke causes that are known to have the power to produce the effect in question. Mm -hmm. Now, I had become fascinated in the mid-'80s with this problem of the origin of biological information. It turns out that organisms are chock full of digital codes stored in the DNA molecule and other forms of information stored elsewhere. And there is a complex information processing system at work inside organisms that allows them to function and survive. So if you want to build a new cell, if you want to build life in the first place, or if you want to build an animal, you have to have the evolutionary process would have to produce a great deal of information. Mm -hmm. But that was the very question that was bringing a lot of evolutionary theories to a point of impasse. And so I began to think about this. What is the cause now in operation that produces digital code, that produces information? And I realized there's only one, and that cause is intelligence or mind. In other words, what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning, is that intelligence produces information whether we find it in a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or a section of software code, whenever we find information and trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And so I realized that by using Darwin's own method of reasoning and his key principle of scientific mm. reasoning, we could make a, a very rigorous scientific case for intelligent design. So when people say it's not science, I want to say, well, well why? Uh, we're, it's based on scientific evidence, and we're using a, an established method of scientific reasoning, in fact, the very method that Darwin used. If the theory of intelligent design isn't scientific, by that same logic, then Darwinism would have, Darwinism would have to be excluded from that same designation. Mm. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> just a, you said you were fascinated by something in the mid-'80s. I remember yeah. that. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, it's funny, in the mid-'80s, I was fascinated with the eurythmics. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, in any case, well, before we get to your book now, I wanted to, um, actually, uh, to be honest, I was not fascinated by the arrhythmics at all. Um, to, uh, before we get to your book, I want to ask you uh, about irreducible complexity. That's another one of these terms that gets thrown around. What you were just saying, essentially, is that the things that uh, exist, these organisms that exist, are too complex probably too complex to simply have appeared. And it seems that something with that much complexity, that much information, and when you say information, you mean? Well, uh, digital code. Yeah. Watson and Crick, 1953. They elucidate the structure of the famous double helix, yeah. uh, the, the DNA molecule. Four years later, Crick proposes something called the sequence hypothesis, which is, uh, was the recognition that there are four chemicals, they're called bases, mm -hmm. that run along the spine of the DNA that function like alphabetic characters in a written language right. or digital characters in the machine code. And, and since then, we've learned that that information is directing the construction of mechanical parts. It, 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 so essentially before, the, okay, the, but so before Watson and Crick, we didn't know any of this, right? And so it was, it was much easier to, um, oh, what have we done to the better? It's going to work? Okay. Very good. I'm going to sing. Is that okay? Uh, well, what you're saying, I, I, I just want to want to be sure. In other words, before Watson and Crick, we did not know about the vast, ridiculous amounts of encoded information encoded, in DNA. We didn't know about it's that. It's typographic or alphabetic or digital. I mean, any of those terms are apt and okay. apply. Um, we have an animation online which shows the DNA molecule. It's the, right. you know, the, the helix structure. Mm -hmm. But along the interior of that molecule, there are these four chemicals. And the chemists actually represent them with the letters A, T, G, and C. And depending upon their arrangement, right. the molecule is conveying 
information for building different types of proteins, and proteins are the little machines sure, and cells sure. that do all the key jobs that keep yeah, cells alive. Yeah, I mean, alive. I remember Francis Collins spoke a, a few years ago when he was talking about this, and the, just the level of complexity, just to bring it to that, is just absurd. It's, it's, it's beyond our ability to comprehend. And now that we know that, it seems generally implausible that this just happened, that things of this level of complexity just happened. And so, um, but then there's something else related. I just want to get this out of the way before we leap into your book. But explain uh, this concept of irreducible complexity. Right. The, the, the case for intelligent design is, is not so much made in the negative as, well, it's so complex it couldn't have arisen by an undirected process. Mm. It's really made in the affirmative by noting features in living organisms organisms that we know from experience are produced by one and only one type of cause. One of those features is digital information. Okay. okay and that's the argument that I've developed. Mike Behe has developed a separate argument from the presence of a, a feature that engineers recognize. They, engineers sometimes talk about integrated complexity. Right. Behe calls it irreducible complexity. Okay. And that is a, a feature of systems where, wherein you have a, a great deal, a great number of parts. Right. And if you remove any one of those parts, the whole system ceases to function. Right, so it could not have evolved. It's not a gradual process. It, it had to be put together or yeah. it wouldn't work. The intermediate stages on the way, he, he makes famous this little, and it, I kid you not, it's a rotary engine that's inside the cell wall of bacterium. It's called a bacterial flagellar motor. It's high tech and low life. And it's got 30, pro it's made of 30 protein parts. It has O-rings, bushings, a drive shaft, uh, a hook-like propeller that, or a protein that functions like a propeller, and it rotates at 100,000 RPM, can change direction on a quarter turn. It's an amazing machine. And what has been discovered by the biochemists working on this machine is that the, the 29 part, the 28 part, the 27 part version of this is non-viable. It doesn't perform any function. Darwin said that natural selection selects for functional advantage. It preserves those things that pass on a, a, an advantage in the competition for survival. Mm -hmm. Well, these intermediate stages have no functional right. advantage, and so you couldn't build this up gradually, and that's a big part of his okay. argument. Um, I want to ask you about your book. Do you mind? Not at all. Because we've got a lot of copies here. We've got to move some product. Um, <laughs> uh, the book has done well. Um, it's very, very impressive. Um, it's called Darwin's Doubt. Tell us, what does that title mean? Well. Darwin, uh, in contrast to the rhetorical excess of some of the modern neo-Darwinists, Richard Dawkins, uh, if you find someone who's skeptical about evolution, they're either ignorant, stupid, wicked, or insane. You know? Right, or well, one of his ex-wives, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, who and, were all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they taught me an acting class back in high school to let the... The right, laughter, to let the laughter but right. I wasn't saying anything funny. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he he uh, he said that. Uh, we were not we were talking about I have Dawkins. No, I have no I idea. Lost the thread. He's got. I think Melba was the third wife. Yeah. And um, let me see. Oh, you. I know. Darwin's you were saying doubt. yes. Go ahead. Yeah, Darwin's that, doubt. It's a book you wrote. Right. I think. Yeah. In con in contrast to Dawkins and crew, Darwin was actually very modest in his expression. He acknowledged difficulties with his theory, and he had a, a very significant doubt about one particular class of evidence. It was called uh, an event in the history of life called the, Ca the Cambrian Explosion. Okay, so uh, what is the Cambrian Explosion? You were probably excellent. just going to tell us. Yeah. The, the, the Cambrian I Explosion is the, the geologically abrupt or sudden or discontinuous appearance of most of the major groups of animals. Uh, in the fossil record. And this happened around 580 million years About ago? About 530 million is oh, the Oh, you say, five, I say 580. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, so in, in other words, that evolution was not a smooth process, or whatever happened, the change of life forms was not a smooth process. The Cambrian explosion says that suddenly, roughly 530 million years ago, wham, all kinds of things all happened. All kinds of really... It was not gradual, and that's why they call exactly. it an explosion. Exactly. Remember that second okay. definition of evolution was the idea of gradual evolution right. as represented by the tree of life. Very slow. So right out of the chute, you've got something that's challenging one of Dar the meanings of Darwin's theory. It also challenged his idea of natural selection, and he called them natural selection and random variations, because... His, he envisioned the mechanism of natural selection and random variation working very slowly and gradually. He recognized that if there were big changes from one generation to another, you get deformed organisms. Mm. So the, the changes had to be very small and incremental, which meant the, the process needed a great deal of time. And what he saw 
uh, and yet what he saw in the fossil record was this abrupt appearance of, of these major groups. Darwin saw this. Darwin saw so this. So even in his day, we, right. they, he saw this. Right. Now, he expected and hoped that the subsequent fossil finds would fill in those big gaps. Right. But as I show in the book, uh, the, 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 the gaps have gotten more pronounced, and the discontinuity is, is more pervasive. Okay, so yes, as time has passed, We've, since Darwin, right. the fossil record has in fact shown the, the opposite of what he hoped. The ancestral precursors uh, have not turned up in the pre-Cambrian mm -hmm. layers, and in the Cambrian, we've discovered many more exotic creatures with lots of intricate organs and structures and body plans that were unknown to Darwin that have been discovered in that same seam of rock all the way around the world. The most dramatic finds of which are in the Burgess Shale in Canada and an amazing find in southern China in the, in the, in the last couple decades. So what are... So the, the explosion has become more explosive, basically. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How frightening. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so why is the book titled Darwin's Doubt? He saw this? He I saw mean, this, and what the, the book does is tell the story of that doubt, and it traces that doubt it, 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 to, up to modern times and shows that the problem that Darwin recognized has become more acute in two different respects. First, the fossil missing, what I call the mystery of the missing fossils, has become more acute as we've discovered all these new forms of Cambrian life, and, and all of which are also missing ancestral forms. But the second mystery that I address in the book is, a, I think, a deeper mystery. It's essentially an engineering problem. And so the second part of the book is, is subtitled, How to Build an Animal. And we, what we now know about the centrality and importance of information, both digital information and other forms of information to building animals, poses this really difficult problem. How can natural selection acting on these random changes, random mutations, generate whole new stretches of functional genetic code? Imagine a computer program that's performing an important function in your computer, and then imagine randomly changing the digital bits then ask yourself a question. Are you more likely to, by doing that, produce a whole new operating system or computer program, or are you, or, or are you more likely to, to degrade the information that's already there? Since the 1960s, there's been an immense skepticism among mathematicians, computer scientists, and other engineers about the efficacy, the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism, because they don't see how uh, random changes in typographic characters is going to generate a whole new functional sequences of information. So, but if there is debate uh, among people in the academy about these kinds of things, why are um, some scientists or why is the establishment so dismissive of intelligent design? In other words, wh what is the internal debate and how does that play out? Well, I think it, it's, it's hard to speculate about, you know, the motives that people have for some of the extreme reactions that they... Uh, offer to this. But I think what you put your finger on before about the, the prior philosophical commitment to a materialistic form of science uh, is one of the reasons. Because this idea that there, is, there, that there is a purpose of intelligence behind some of these key features we see in life clearly challenges the, 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 the matter, the, the materialist okay. view. It's a mind over matter view of reality. In, in other words, the internal critics, people who are saying this doesn't make sense, are uh, not saying, well, we think we've got a solution, there's an intelligence behind this. Instead, what they're saying is, we don't know, and we assume there's a materialist answer that I, will I reveal itself. I got a itself. very interesting letter from a very prominent scientist. I won't mention him by name now, but... What, uh, what are his initials? Uh, <laughs> you, you did that trick once tonight. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he, he, it was after, after the publication of the first book, Signature in the Cell, and he said, I entirely agree with the scientific analysis you've done, even the RNA world, which was the hot chemical evolutionary idea, he said, is, is, is going nowhere and everyone knows it. He said, but he said, I, and I'd like to say more publicly about your book, but he said, I'm committed to a materialistic solution to this problem. Mm. So your science is right, but we differ philosophically, was right. what he was saying. And I think that is, that is actually the, this, the, the basis of a lot of the the, the difference. This is a very cordial and, and, and respectful guy, but a lot of the people who are not, are, I think they're less aware of their own materialistic premises right. in the way they're conducting well, science. Well, th those of us who are uh, non-scientists, and I'm uh, an extreme uh, non-scientist, um, are really unaware of the debate within the world of, of science and uh, other disciplines. We, we, it's not the sort of thing one reads about uh, in the New York Times or wherever. It's just not the, thing, the kind of thing we'd been that we would normally be uh, made aware of or, or would be aware of. 
Um, and there's this general sense uh, in the culture, I think, um, that this has all been decided and figured out, and there isn't much debate, uh, that, that, that the science is, is settled, so to speak, and uh, you know, move along, there's nothing to talk about. That, that's what got me into it. When I, I was at a particular conference where the, the problems in origin of life studies, chemical evolutionary theory, were being discussed, and I had, after two science majors as an undergraduate, been under the impression that all the science was settled, but um, uh, it's, it's far more interesting than that. In the new book, uh, I, one of the, the themes, I, I tell a mystery story, but there's a, there's a kind of a journalistic ex expose involved in the, in the story as well, because I show that there's a huge disparity between the public presentation of the status of modern Darwinian theory by people at the New York Times or uh, in the, all the major science organizations have, have, have committees that make pronouncements on this by the public spokesman for the theory, like Richard Dawkins or Jerry Coyne. Uh, so there's a huge disparity between what they say and how they present the, mm. the theory to the public and what's going on in the, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. And by that, I don't just mean biology generally. I'm even talking about evolutionary biology. And mm. one of the things I do in the book is I look at, at uh, si there are six new theories of evolutionary biology that have been proposed in just the last few years by scientists who are breaking with the textbook orthodoxy of neo-Darwinism. Some of them are openly calling for a new theory of evolution precisely because they recognize that the, that the mutation natural selection lacks the creative power that has long been attributed to it. Let me simply say, wow. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty amazing, actually. Well, it's a story that hasn't it's, been told. Well, I mean, none of this is told. I was amazed. Just a few years ago, I wrote a, a book of apologetics, and I was looking into some of this, and I was staggered to find that the some of the stuff that I took as gospel truth, I mean, most of us in um, school someplace saw the famous Heckel drawings, the ontology recapitulates phylogeny, um, which shows that uh, in, in embryo form, uh, all these different animals look exactly the same, and it shows that, you know, w that we sort of, uh, we come from a common ancestor or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I learned that those drawings, which are so famous and ingrained in, in so many of our minds, were basically fudged and, and are no longer accepted. And, and I was it, just amazed because it's, you know, finding out that, you know, uh, Pluto it, is not a planet, which I just did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's right. And, and oddly, in that case, they were known to be fraudulent from since 1894, the famous uh, Cambridge embryologist Adam Sedwick, Sedwick had exposed that almost a century ago. Stephen Jay Gould thought this was just an appalling uh, recycling of, of bad science in our textbooks. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, 1894, I, I was not in school uh, <laughs> then. It, it is pretty amazing. The same thing with the, um, the famous, I don't know if it's still there, at the Museum of Natural History, the Eohippus, uh, um, do you know what I'm talking about? The, the horse sequence. The, the, hor yeah, the, yeah. the horse sequence. Uh, the, I, don't, I don't even know if that's still there anymore, but it, it, it seems that it was the same kind of thing, basically fudged, that it, it's not necessarily something that happened. I mean, any of this kind of stuff was big news to me, I have to say. And then the idea that there are these big gaps in the fossil record, also not exactly something that's taught in the schools, at least not where I went to school. Well, and, and what you're finding in the peer-reviewed literature is this engineering problem, as I refer to it, you know, is, is really what's, what is... Um, uh, generating a lot of skepticism among evolutionary biologists because the complexity of these systems, just let me try one little technical argument and see if we can make this clear. It's really fascinating to me. There are these, w to build an animal, it turns out that you not only need all this genetic information, but there are, are, are circuits. Um, and these circuits are crucial to getting the right cells to differentiate, to getting cells to differentiate from each other and go to the right place as you're building an animal as it unfolds from embryo to adult. But there's a problem. As we've done, uh, as, as developmental biologists have done experiments on this circuitry, they're called developmental gene regulatory networks, they find that even modest alterations in these circuits have catastrophic, uh, catastrophic effects. But to build a new animal, you need new types of circuitry to make sure that the cells in the other type of animal get to their right places. So to, to build one animal form from another, you need a new type of circuit, but you can't alter the original circuit without destroying the animal during its development. And you have these kinds of problems. I look at four or five of this, these types of really intractable engineering problems confronting the evolutionary mechanism. And it's one of the reasons that so many top-line evolutionary biologists are themselves looking for a new approach. Not necessarily intelligent design, but they're saying this, this neo-Darwinian uh, approach is, is, is failing us.
Well, before we go uh, to the to the Q and A, I just want to ask you um, a couple quick things. But the first one, I guess, is where do you see all of this going? Because when you have this uh, paleontologist from Holyoke saying that this is a your book is a game changer, uh, there seem to be you know cracks uh, in the dam. It seems clear that. Uh, this uh, you know, unified front is, is not as unified as it once was, and it seems to me that there's a possibility of some shifting around. But what, we, what do you see? Is, is there hope that uh, people in, in the academy might accept some of this? I mean, it seems hard for me to believe, but I'm, I'm just getting some signs of hope, so I'm curious from your point of view, what do you think? Well, I think it's actually very exciting. We're not hearing about a lot of it in the media, and I think the, the metaphor you used of attempting to kill, kill the baby in the bassinet was you know, exactly right. In the 2004, 2005, when the, the, the work on intelligent design broke into the public uh, awareness through the media, there was a big trial in Dover, and Wired Magazine did a cover story on us, and uh, a lot of media attention. The, 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 the official line, media line was, or narrative was, this is a faith-based idea. Time Magazine had a cover story, and that was, the, it was a faith-based idea. But the idea is actually based on science, scientific evidence, and a scientific method of reasoning. And what's, what we're now finding is that there is a growing uh, subterranean descent against Darwinism. And many of those scientists are getting in contact with us. And there's a, a growing network internationally of scientists who are contributing to this intelligent design research program. We've talked mainly about how the evidence might point to a designer or how it might challenge uh, Darwinian evolution. But once you're convinced that life is a design system, it leads to experiments and a different way of looking at life that may have what scientists call heuristic value. It may lead to new discoveries. One of the predictions that we made, for example, that was different than the Darwinian prediction was the prediction about so-called junk DNA. And last fall, it was confirmed by this massive ENCODE project that the junk DNA, which was thought to be the detritus, the leftovers from the trial and error mutation selection process, turned out to be importantly functional, just as the ID proponents had, had predicted. So we think this leads to in really fruitful directions of, for new science, and we're seeing an awful lot of scientists coming to us, oddly, especially Europeans. Some very high-profile uh, European scientists have uh, have sort of joined ranks, and so I think there's a, it, it's a, a, I'm very optimistic that the, 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 this materialistic ideology is losing its stranglehold on the practice of science. I'm, a, I'm aware of the junk uh, DNA um, findings because I follow Discovery on Twitter, I just want to say that, and uh, <laughs> yes, I do, and I guess I want to ask what, uh, I mean, what is Francis Collins's, um, um, view of the junk DNA story. Do you know? I mean, well, where does he come out he, on that? He wrote a book in 2006, The Language of God, in which he made some arguments for the second meaning of evolution, common uh, descent, based on, um, uh, on the non-functionality of certain genes that were present with us and present with chimps. And the argument is, look, if these things aren't performing a function and they're present in... Like an appendix, right? I mean, Yeah, to, something like that, only at the it, genetic To break level. it down for us, and, like an appendix. Yeah. It has no use, but it just ended up there because that's, that's what happened. And clearly, it wouldn't uh, happen God twice, would not design yeah. us with an appendix. Why would he do such a thing? Yeah, and you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have and, two... And now that you're here, why would he? <laughs> And, and, and the idea is you wouldn't have in two different organisms two essentially broken genes that aren't doing anything unless they had a common ancestor. And since Collins wrote that book in 06, a lot of this has come out. Some of it in, in, uh, uh, under his direction. He's had his name on a number of these scientific papers that have established the functionality of many of these allegedly broken genes or, or sections of junk DNA. So I think a lot of those arguments have to be reassessed. And uh, it's an interesting dynamic uh, area of, of scientific conversation. But clearly, the, the main Darwinian argument, I mean, I got this right before I published Signature in the Cell. There were people writing papers saying, well, if the, if the genome is designed, if the information in DNA points to an intelligent designer, why is so much of the genome junk? Right. And it turned out not to be so. In fact, what's fascinating to me is that overall, that non, those non-protein coding regions of the genome are not junk at all, but they, they function much like an operating system in a computer that are regulating the expression of the data files. They're regulating the timing and expression of the, of the information that does build, build proteins. So what we're looking at is a really sophisticated information processing system in even the very simplest cells. Um, since I mentioned Francis Collins, I just remembered another question I want to ask you. I, I, I get confused. Um, when people talk about theistic evolution, 
Um, I'm under the impression that theistic evolution means that people believe the process of evolution happened, but that God directed it. But then when somebody says uh, intelligent design, it sounds like the same thing. Where would intelligent design differ from so-called theistic evolution? Um, well, it really depends on which meaning of evolution is being affirmed by the theistic evolutionist. Uh, the first meaning of evolution, change over time, is, uh, is something that certainly you, you, uh, uh, it's uh, perfectly coherent to merge that with a, a form of theism. Certainly God can cause change over time. God could also even cause continuous, gradual change over time, though there's increasing evidence that life on earth did not emerge in a, gradual, in a completely gradual way. Um, where I think the concept of theistic evolution breaks down is when you try to merge theism with the idea of an unguided, undirected process. Not even God can direct an unguided, undirected process because as soon as God is directing it, it's no longer undirected. But the, what? Wouldn't they? Um, <laughs> but wouldn't? It, I mean, it's kind of like saying, you know, uh, if I roll the dice, right? Uh, did God make it? Say, you know, <clears throat> snake eyes in this case, right? Um, or if he didn't, maybe he didn't, but he knew that it would be snake eyes. In other words, couldn't that be the case with theistic evolution? Isn't that what they say? Wouldn't they say that, look, um, yes, it's random. On one level, it's random, and maybe that's why you objected to the word random earlier, but it's, it's random, but, but God knew that it would go this way. And you're, you're saying that that's well, in not a sense, possible? The, the key question for theistic evolutionists, and, and there, there are forms of theistic evolution that are consistent with intelligent design. If God is directing the evolutionary process to a propitious outcome, that is a form of intelligent design. Right. So then the argument is really only over whether that directed form of evolution is continuous or more episodic. Okay, And that's, in, in, in the metaphysical sense, not a really big, big disagreement. But... Um, the, what, what I've been calling for is more clarity in the use of this term because it can mean so many different things depending on, on, on whether we're talking about uh, evolution number one, two, or three the, three, the three meanings that I was talking about. I guess I'm just fascinated and because here, one it's other, so... One other, one other key point, though. Many theistic evolutionists are saying that the mutation selection mechanism is God's way of creating. Right. And what I show in the yeah. book is the mutation selection mechanism has very limited... Uh, uh, creative power. And so for theists who are looking for a way okay. to harmonize science and faith, this is a losing strategy. Right. This is like the Catholic Church backing the Aristotelian cosmology just before Galileo came along. When you have leading uh, secular evolutionary biologists saying that that mechanism is of very limited creative power. I mean, one, one a quote that I like is a, a biologist who says that natural selection explains the survival but not the arrival of the fittest. It explains the little stuff, but not the origin of whole new body plans or circuitry or genetic information. And so it's, it, it, to me, seems an odd time for the push right. within the religious world right. to baptize Darwin and say, this is the way God did it, when the, when the scientific establishment is, while not open to a theistic or an ID perspective, is still very much becoming disenchanted with the Darwinian mechanism. Okay, so, so, people, so you would say that, that uh, people of faith who are, are saying that, you know, we believe in evolution, um, this kind of evolution, well, you're, you're saying that they're, they're backing a loser... And they, they think it makes them cool, you know, to back this particular loser because they don't think it is a loser. But you're saying that science itself is going to show that this can't work. Is already increasingly doing so, absolutely, yeah. And Very so it's, it, it is a losing horse, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, um, I want to open uh, the conversation up uh, to the folks uh, who've come. But um, <laughs> we welcome your questions, and I should say... Uh, up front that Dr. Meyer uh, has asked that your questions, if you don't mind, be true or false questions, just to <laughs> just kind of move it along, to move it along here. I love when there are no questions. Look at this. Now, you know what will happen? Let me predict. Uh, let me okay, predict that ahead. in a moment, at the end of this, when we're out of time, there's going to be eight people at each microphone. This always happens. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Mustafa. Yeah. Hi. And Thomas uh, Kuhn's book, he talks about paradigms and how you can um, articulate paradigms through experiments. And my question is, with intelligent design, how do you articulate this particular paradigm, assuming that it is a, a new scientific paradigm, how do you articulate it 
through experiments. The reason why I ask the question is speaking to lay people, and I'm a lay person myself, I'm not a scientist. When you speak to lay people about intelligent design, you see this look on their face like, you're not intelligent. <laughs> but then when you speak to them... I know that look. Yeah, yeah. But when, when, you, <laughs> yeah. when you speak to them about evolution, no matter how mathematically impossible it may seem, you sound intelligent because there's this you know, sort of mechanism that we have grown to believe in as the evolutionary process where there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for ID. So what, what is the testability of intelligent design? Excellent, excellent question. I, I address this in great depth in both books, but um, first the, question, uh, the point about mechanism, the, the methodological imperative of historical science is to establish a cause for events in the past. And causes may be mechanistic, they may be material, but they may be ultimately mental. They may be uh, the result, uh, some types of effects only arise from conscious or rational activity. If someone were to walk into the uh, British Museum and look at the Rosetta Stone and say, isn't it wonderful what wind and erosion did? We would say that person has missed something important in the causal story of those inscriptions. And so while intelligent but just, design... Just, to, just before you get yeah. too far ahead, it, so the Rosetta Stone did not just happen. It was produced by an intelligent okay. agent Just as opposed want to, be to a purely Thank you. material Go ahead. cause. Yeah. So we're offering not a mechanism, but an alternative kind of cause. But, having, but then that raises the question of testability. How would you test that? And there are two aspects of every scientific theory. There are, there, one aspect is explaining the facts we already have, and one is making predictions about new facts. It turns out that intelligent design does both. Um, and the first, much of what I've done is work on the first problem. We've got a whole suite of different types of evidences, and I show that intelligent design provides a better explanation of those already known facts than undirected material processes of various kinds. And in doing that, I use a, me a method of reasoning that Darwin used, known as inference to the best explanation, where the best explanation is one that cites a cause which is known to produce the effects in question. So when we're looking at an inference to the, a, a past cause, one of the key tests is, is that cause is, is the test of our uniform and repeated experience in the present. Is the cause that we're citing known to produce the kind of uh, effect that we see? A geologist, for example, in my state, Washington, out on the west coast, might go to eastern Washington, see a layer of ash, and say, hmm, how do I explain that white ash among the, in, in, the, in the Palouse soil? Well, different hypotheses might be proposed. Maybe it was a flood, maybe it was an earthquake, maybe it was a volcanic eruption. Which one is best using Darwin's method? Well, it's the volcanic eruption, because what we know from our experience is that volcanoes produce that effect, whereas floods and earthquakes don't. So there, there's a different type of testability for historical scientific theories. Having said that, intelligent design also makes discriminating predictions. And in the epilogue to, uh, or one of the ep um, appendices to Signature in the Cell, the first book, uh, I lay out 10 separate predictions that ID makes that are, diff that, that, that are different, that, than the predictions that a competing evolutionary model would make. One of them we've talked about already, the prediction about the non-coding regions of the genome being functional rather than junk. So it, it, and I have a colleague, Doug Axe, who is heading up our lab, the Biologic Institute, who's doing all kinds of really interesting experimental work. So a lot of people just, they need to kind of take a, a lap around the block with us to hear about this, and then it starts to make a little more sense. Yeah. So I'm just shocked that the Rosetta Stone didn't just happen. That's the first I've heard. What, what about Mount Rushmore? Because that's... Uh, Same deal, yeah. Really? Wind and erosion, that's, baby. It's wind and erosion. Yeah, wind made and that erosion. Happen. See, that's amazing how nature plans and schemes. Um, yes, sir. So if, if we accept your axioms and um, agree with an intelligent designer, I'm curious your argument as to why or if that intelligent designer is necessarily a benevolent deity versus, say a vindictive group of aliens who are taking bets on how many antelopes are gonna be eaten on the Serengeti on a random Tuesday. Uh, or a grad school, a grad student on Andromeda, my debating partner, Michael Ruse, always says. Uh, excellent question. Uh, notice the, in the way I formulated the argument scientifically that I'm basing the inference to design based on our uniform and repeated experience in the present of those causes which, of which we know that are capable of producing information or irreducible complexity or circuitry or the kind of things we find in organisms. Because we know from our experience of being conscious agents, we have experience in the presence of what minds can do. 
But the method of reasoning that I use does not get you past the affirmation of a mind simpliciter. In other words, uh, some kind of mind with the capacities that are, that are similar or analogous to ours. That, that, but it does raise a second order question that goes beyond the use of this scientific method as to the identity of the designing intelligence that might be responsible for the origin of life or the origin of animal life. And uh, there are different possibilities. At the close of the Ben Stein film that Eric talked about, Richard Dawkins, of all people, actually speculated that perhaps there is a signature of intelligence inside the cell, but if so, he said, it must have been produced by an imminent intelligence within the cosmos, which itself evolved through strictly material processes. Ben Stein called that the ABG hypothesis, anything but God. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I hold in that second order deliberation to a theistic view, because I see evidence of design not only in the history of life, but I see it from the very beginning of the universe, built into the, the fabric of the universe itself in what the physicists refer to as the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and of the initial conditions of the universe. And I think whereas you might be able to invoke an imminent intelligence within the cosmos to account for the design we see in biology, clearly no being within the cosmos could account for the, the, the design we see built into the very fabric of the universe itself from the beginning. And so I think that overall, when you look at the range of evidences of design that we see, we have Jay Richards here who's written on evidence in physics and planetary astronomy, uh, I think that the, the best explanation is a theistic design hypothesis, but I, I would say that that's a, a second-order philosophical conclusion rather than something that flows out of the scientific method that I use in the books. Um, I normally uh, say this in Sacramento City. I forgot to say it earlier, but uh, both questions have, uh, have not been too long, but we want to limit them to about 14 syllables, if you can hang... <laughs> Get the hang of that. The questions were fine. And it was I, the answers. And I want, oh, no, 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 sure. no, 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 no. And I want to say, well, we've been doing fine so far, but there's going to there's be a couple of monologues happening if, unless we warn against it. Uh, and yes, the, the, the question must be uh, phrased in the form of a question. So go ahead, sir. Um, do you think the um, so-called young earthers uh, completely lack uh, a scientific method or, or perhaps are they just misinterpreting uh, the facts, because some of them seem quite intelligent. <laughs> well, there are very, some very intelligent young Earth uh, scientists, and um, uh, I just happen to hold a different view on the age of the Earth, Earth and the age of the universe. Um, there, it, to, there's a kind of typology here that might be helpful. Uh, everyone who accepts, they're, they're, they're young Earth and old Earth creationists. And, and both, both of those schools of thought like intelligent design, because if you're a creationist, there was a designer, right? But if you accept intelligent design, it doesn't, it doesn't follow that you necessarily affirm young earth creationism or old earth creationism. The, the question of design or apparent design is essentially an age-neutral question. And so while I don't hold the young earth view, I can see how someone might affirm intelligent design and have a different view on the age question than I do. Thank you. Yes. Every once in a while, I see a triumphalist headline that says evolution has been proved in the lab. And you'll have- <laughs> One more time. One yeah. more time, yeah. right. So like in Michigan State, they went through 31,000 generations of E. coli and then a strain emerged that could metabolize citrate or uh, post genetics came out with fruit flies that could fly around in levels of oxygen that would be deficient for earlier populations. Could you just articulate and clarify what is being proven and what is not being established uh, it's by a, these experiments? a really excellent question. Uh, there is a distinction in evolutionary biology between what's called macro and micro evolution. And the, uh, very oftentimes, if you make that distinction in an actual discussion, people will accuse the, you of using creationist yeah. terminology. But this is terminology within the discipline itself. And that, that, the, the, uh, the short quip I, I cited a minute ago, it, uh, natural selection explains the survival but not the arrival. It explains small-scale variation of the kind these experiments demonstrate. But it does not account for fundamental innovation in, in body plan, uh, anatomical structure, and that's, that sort of thing. So the kinds of things that are trumpeted as proof positive are very minor modifications that are typically um, being achieved because of variations in pre-existing genetic information. They're drawing on pre-existing sources of genetic information, whereas macroevolutionary change, the origin of whole new animals in the Cambrian period, requires huge infusions of new genetic information. And, and so it's uh, a, a, really a different, a different kind of phenomenon. 
I'm not sure that we'll get to all the questions. I didn't say this earlier, but meant to as well, that we always try to end on time at Socrates in the City, just so you know uh, that you don't have to, to sneak out. We will end uh, certainly by 8.15. So, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, I had a question. Um, both uh, Darwinist and Young Earth Creationist have a positive model of how life was produced. Is it within the scope of ID of ever producing a positive model? It seems like up until now it's been more of a negative criticism of why Darwinism cannot be. Oh, I'm, I'm very glad you asked that because the argument is uh, often misportrayed as an, uh, a, a fallacious argument from ignorance, if you know the informal fallacies from logic, or um, uh, a, an argument from personal incredulity. But this, and I, I discuss this objection head on in both books. The argument for intelligent design is a positive argument based on what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world, not just a critique of the inadequacy of the materialistic mechanisms. I do critique those mechanisms because the argument is formulated as an inference to the best explanation. And to claim best, you have to show that the competing explanations are inadequate. But you also have to show that there is a, a basis in an experience for invoking another kind of cause. And, and so the kind of cause that is invoked to account for, for example, the origin of the information necessary to build the Cambrian animals is an intelligent cause, conscious and rational activity. And we invoke it because we have knowledge of what conscious and rational agents can produce. In particular, we know they can produce information, digital information and in other forms, which is the crucial feature of living systems that has to be explained. So it's an argument based on our knowledge of cause and effect and our knowledge of the evidence of biological systems, not just our ignorance of an alternative to neo-Darwinism. Thank you. Yeah. These questions are all very intelligent and we could really use some dumb questions. So please, <laughs> you know, something, I, just keep it simple. I, I, like what's your wife's name or something? I, I read a terrible review of your book in, of all places, a national review. And it was performed by a non-scientist neo-Darwinist who normally finds his home at the Huffington Post. Correct. And I <laughs> had, had to then go and read the Discoveries Institute's response to that, which was very thorough. But I just wondered if you had any background information to how this happened to a respectable, one of the most respectable conservative publications around, like National Review. Well, uh, Political, people that farm out books out for book review are usually doing things on cultural and political issues. And so this guy is, in fact, a hyper-partisan. He does write at the... John Farrell is his name. He's a good writer, but uh, uh, he uh, is not a scientist. And rather than engage any of the really serious arguments of the book that we've been discussing tonight, he took his issue with a single ellipsis mm -hmm. and attempted yes. to show that um, I was guilty of quote mining or taking a quotation out of context. And I had 753 scientific references in the book. And so when I first read the review, uh, I skimmed it on the iPhone, you know, driving home. I thought, well, uh, not a good policy, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, how, how fast were you driving? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, to you know, publish an errata and if, if I uh, mischaracterize a particular scientist. It didn't really bear on the, the argument I was making. Yeah. But I got home and read, read the review carefully. And then I read the scientist, a paleontologist named John Marshall. And, what, what, uh, and I found I, I suddenly was incensed. I didn't get this guy wrong at all. The, I had a block quotation, and the first portion of the quotation was about something called the artifact hypothesis, an explanation of why the fossils are missing in the Precambrian -Cam -Pre layers. The second part was also about the artifact hypothesis, and the second quotation helpfully amplified the first, standard scholarly practice. I then, he, he faulted me for not quoting another passage, and that passage was, he said, was put the whole thing in a different context. It was about an entirely different topic, and it was in, uh, entirely appropriate that I should have excised it, as it was about the duration of the Cambrian explosion, a different technical matter. So um, it was really a poor review, especially poor because it didn't address the main arguments of the book, and I would have welcomed uh, spirited or thoughtful criticism of those. It just didn't come. To, I mean, actually, to throw my own two cents in on that, asking why would a wonderful magazine like National Review um, do something like that? And by the way, Rich Lowry is often here. Is he here? No. The editor of National Review. Maybe he could, you know, is uh, Marshall McLuhan in the audience? He can answer that. Uh, but um, I think oftentimes what happens, and this is why I'm interested uh, uh, in this uh, on one level, is that it's a cultural 
uh, debate. It's not just a scientific debate. And there are many people that would say, well, oh, I'm a conservative, but I'm not that kind of a conservative. Yeah. You don't think I believe in that stuff. And I think that there are probably many people, whether they think of themselves as libertarians or you know, particularly sophisticated conservatives, they would dismiss uh, anything that is, let's say, social conservatism or any conservatism that, or, or any view that would, would uh, uh, invoke a deity, they, they're just uncomfortable. And so I'm not, I'm not so surprised. Uh, I'm dismayed, but I'm not so surprised that well, National me, Review would have published it. Let me defend it. National Review a little bit because I got an email just before we, I, uh, we came over for the event from another NRO, an NRO writer who's going to do an, uh, a piece on the book. He's very excited about it. So they'll be, they'll be teaching the controversy, as we say, within the pages of, of NR, which is a, a great policy on things like this. But I also want to speak to the, the social anxiety that, that surrounds this issue. There is this stigma and stereotype that anyone who's questioning Darwinism is doing so. In fact, this is the dominant narrative. That if, that, you know, when Darwin came along, it was after centuries of people believing in a divine creator, then there was this overwhelming scientific evidence that overthrew that idea, and anyone who questions Darwin now is doing so because they're an insecure religious fundamentalist. And one of the things I try to do in the book is show there is a really interesting a scientific basis for the dissenting opinion that is now bubbling up all over the place in the scientific community, and that that narrative is just simply, if it was ever true, it's no longer true. And, and the social, you know, it's the image of the white-shoed Bible thumper from a, a very rural place who drools, you know. Right. And, um, Careful because there are two in the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. But they're always, they always show up. They're wonderful people. But, uh, but um, you know, you just don't want to get there, too close there is to some, home. Very, very scientifically sophisticated and, and uh, dissent, and it's, it needs to be heard as part of the discussion. The other thing I'd say is that I think many of the policy and cultural magazines, uh, they sense but don't entirely, rec entirely recognize why this issue is important to everything else they care about. Um, the Wall Street Journal uh, had a great cartoon a little while ago in their salt and pepper cartoon you know, that they do on the op-ed page. And it was a, um, a hapless guy before a judge. And he says, not guilty by reason of millions of years of evolutionary selection for aggressive behavior, your honor. <laughs> and it, it, it's a funny cartoon, but actually I went back and looked at this. The first instance of what's called the diminished responsibility plea, the, you know, I did it because I was insane, was actually made by Clarence Darrow in 1924 in the famous Leopold and Loeb case, the, the thriller murder case. Two young University of Chicago college students killed a 12-year-old boy for the thrill of it to show their independence from bourgeois morality. And they were convicted. At the point of sentencing, the ACLU sent out Darrow, and he argued that, yes, they did have defective moral machinery, but they had such defective moral machinery because they were the product of an unguided, undirected, mindless evolutionary process. You know, it, it, not, not Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, right. but Flip Wilson, you know, right. my evolutionary history did. I just can't tell you how I love the fact that you referenced Flip Wilson. That's just... <laughs> you've made my night. Okay, go ahead, sir. Could everything have been designed in to what I'll call the primordial soup where all the radiation, you know, even the Cambrian explosion could have been programmed. Front end loaded. Front end yeah. loaded right. the way that, you know, a one or two cell embryo can radiate into a very complicated, uh, you know, organism. A excellent question. Um, I'll try to be brief since we're running out of time, but that's, that's entirely a matter of the empirical data. It could be either, and there are, are proponents of intelligent design who think everything was front-end loaded at the beginning of the universe, others who see it at the beginning of life. Um, I actually hold the view that, that there were multiple infusions of new information along the way. There's, uh, in the interest of time, there is a, a video, uh, the, the under 30s at our office who are tech whizzes have created a YouTube channel of uh, videos, and there's one on this very question, could the design that we see in evidence have been front end loaded. Could you explain the origin of life from the fine tuning of the laws of physics at the very beginning? I think there's a good scientific reason that you couldn't. There's not enough information in that fine tuning to account for the information you need to build a cell. And so I think we're looking at multiple infusions of information, if you will. But to explain why would take a little more time than we have tonight, but I'd refer you to that video. It's a great question. And it is an open question for people who are open to considering design. It's not a one size fit all. There's different models of intelligent design that, that scientists are developing. Uh, many people right now are looking into the works of Alvin Plantinga as a philosopher of science, right? And if I'm not mistaken, you have I, a PhD, I know Alvo, yeah. right? And, uh, yeah. Philosophy of science. And, and many people seem to have this view that you and him are kind of like antithetical, oh. you know? In, in, in some ways of like either because he believes in like guided evolution and 
you know, all well, that. Let me, like, let, yeah, let me clarify his position because um, we just had Al out to the office. I've known him since the 80s, and yeah. he's been really a, a friend of the ID movement. One, his main work in the, in the philosophy of science has been challenging this principle known as methodological naturalism that says that scientists must limit themselves to materialistic explanations even if they're looking at the Rosetta Stone or okay. digital information and DNA. And he says, no, there's no presumption of a materialistic explanation. We need to be open to all explanations. He's making an evolution of much more narrow logical point that randomness might be, uh, what we look at as randomness might be, uh, there might be a hidden hand behind it. And so he's also deeply skeptical about the scientific evidence for neo-Darwinism. So I, the, 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 uh, I, I think there are very few differences, actually, between Plantinga and most of the leaders in the ID movement. There have been some interesting discussions about this issue of randomness. Jay Richards, my colleague, has uh, had some very good online discussions with Al on these questions. I'd refer you to those. There are some, some slight differences in opinion about the extent to which Darwinism is inherently committed to a materialistic uh, uh, approach and w the extent to which it might be harmonizable, if you will, with uh, a, a, some sort of guidance. But if there is guidance to the mechanism, that would be a form of intelligent design. Yeah. So uh, my question was, are you, is there any difference between you? And if not, which you have said that, like, <laughs> it is, what is it or is it? You know. Yeah, the, the difference, and, and we, we had a really good discussion about this, and so we're, you know, we're all learning from each other on it, but um, <clears throat> I think the main difference would be the extent to which the mechanism of natural selection and random variation could be understood to be a teleological process, could be guided, okay? And I, I think if it is guided, then it's certainly a, a mode of intelligent design, just as there are young earth creationists, old earth creationists who are proponents of intelligent design. There are theistic evolutionists who would also wear that moniker. There's a common view. If there's a mind involved as a causal agent, that's intelligent design, whether it's gradual or episodic. But there's a technical point about Darwinism. It can't, is the mechanism of natural selection inherently an unguided mechanism? I think it's built into the logic of the argument that Darwin makes in the third chapter of The Origin that it's an inherently unguided mechanism because he sets up natural selection in opposition to artificial selection, intelligent selection, and says, look, nature can do what the breeder can do. And, uh, but I, I do acknowledge that you could have, uh, you, you could see, you could conceive of something that looks unguided that might have a mind behind it. But when you, the real crucial question is that appearance of design that we actually see in the evidence. And, and if you acknowledge that that appearance is the result of actual design, then you're in the ID camp, whether you say, well, God was guiding something or it was more episodic or, uh, or, or creation by fiat. So uh, I think the differences on that level are, they're, they're really fine points of logic about what is Darwin saying. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Meyer, with the advances in research and the seeming cultural acceptance that's growing around intelligent design, do you see it being taught in schools at the very least, even alongside a theory with evolution sometime in the near future? Well, it is being discussed with various degrees of openness and or suppression at the university level. Um, there is a case right now in Ball, Ball State University in Indiana. Uh, there are two prominent ID proponents in the astronomy department there. One, Jay Richards' co-author, Guillermo Gonzalez, and the, uh, the other astronomer there, Eric Hedin, has been the subject of a kind of secular witch hunt, really. The Freedom From Religion Foundation uh, started pressuring the university to shut down a course he was doing in, on the boundaries of science because he had two books that were discussing intelligent design, one pro, one con which I think is just absurd. But many, many college professors are discussing these issues, both in science classes and in, uh, in, in uh, philosophy of science classes, and thereby exercising their academic freedom. In the, at the level of the, of the high school curriculum battles where this comes up, um, I think it would be constitutionally permissible. I think intelligent design is a scientific theory that has larger worldview or metaphysical implications. And I think Darwinism is, is a scientific theory that has competing metaphysical and worldview implications. Uh, so teaching one, uh, teaching them side by side, teaching about these theories without being, a, without uh, trying to indoctrinate students, I think would be, should be constitutionally permissible. However, I think it's imprudent for our side right now to be trying to push intelligent design into the, the public school textbook battles 
because um, there's such confusion about church-state jurisprudence that inevitably a sensible policy is going to kick this up into the courts. And for us, we want our scientists working on the science right now. We're trying to prosecute this argument at the highest levels of the academy, not getting, instead of getting drawn into cases like Dover, where you had the absurdity of a federal judge trying to decide the, the, the definitional question of what is science, which is properly within the provenance of the, of the philosophy of science. So r right now, we think it's imprudent to try to force intelligent design into the schools. When the Dover trial was um, in the news, 2005, there had been one peer-reviewed article uh, uh, in mainstream science journals uh, advocating the theory of intelligent design. It was that new. Now we're approaching 100. And at some point, the trickle becomes a rivulet, becomes a stream, becomes a gush. And there are just too many scientists doing science from this perspe perspective to keep it out of the educational system. Students are going to want to know. They're going to ask their teachers. Teachers are going to want to talk about it. So I'd prefer to let it happen organically than to have a big policy push. That's our, been our position. OK, we've got time for two very brief questions and, and uh, two brief answers. So go ahead. I've seen a lot of discussions with scientists on the evolutionary side where they can almost come to grips with the idea of intelligent design, but they, they define away intelligence to make it seem mechanistic. Is there a difference? I mean, is it really the word personal that throws them for a loop? Is there a difference? <clears throat> well, there you get into some very deep questions in the philosophy of mind. And I accept co consciousness. As I, um, another interesting figure in this discussion is Thomas Nagel, who's written a book, Mind and Cosmos, subtitled with Oxford Press last fall, how the neo-Darwinian materialist view of reality is almost certainly false. And one of the things that Nagel is arguing is that, that consciousness is a fundamental feature of, of the world. Minds are fundamental features of the world. They can't be reduced or explained away by the, the movement of molecules in, in, in synapses. That, 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 uh, and, and I think that we know of our conscious minds by direct introspective experience. And I actually think we know of that better than we know of any, th any conclusion that is rendered to us from science, because all scientific conclusions are mediated to us by the senses and through scientific authorities. And so any, any scientific theory that removes consciousness and, and mind as a reality, it, that it, in other words, that it's so reductive and materialistic that it eliminates what we know best, which is our own reality as conscious agents, is, is a self-contradictory form of, of scientism. And, and so for me, the notion of, any notion of mind which is fundamentally reduced to just an epiphenomenon of matter is actually an incoherent view. Now, I've been asked, could you be a, a, a physicalist about mind and advocate intelligent design? I think that is a possible position, but I think it's ultimately incoherent because I, I reject the physicalist uh, account of, of the mind-body problem. Thank you. Uh, the final question. I have to say, I didn't even know there was such a word as physicalist. I really didn't. Thank you. Um, it's, yeah, it's simply the idea that the mind yeah. is reducible to molecules. Actually, how is yeah. physicalist different from materialist? Very similar. It's the, it, Very similar. Physicalism is the, is the expression of materialism in, in, in the philosophy of mind or cognitive science. Okay. Yeah. Um, as Christians, the basis of our faith is based on uh, the belief in the possibility of the supernatural, from the resurrection of Christ to the virgin birth. And the only place where that notion of the supernatural has a problem is in the cosmopolitan West, not in the rest of the world, per se. And could an argument be made uh, with respect to the Why does the scientific community reject even the possibility of the supernatural as an explanation for things when they recognize, for example, that there was a paradigm that we had with Newtonian physics that was upset by Einstein where everything changed with that. It, it, why isn't there an ability to recognize that there might be paradigms that they're not taking into account? Again, showing complexity or things they've not taken into account that might bring in what we would call the supernatural, things beyond our understanding. Why is that unscientific to even explore that possibility well, that, that, when it, the evidence That's a produces? really great and thoughtful question. And there's a long story, of course, and it's the story of the establishment of, of scientific materialism as the dominant philosophy associated with science. Much of that occurred in the late 19th century. We had Darwin, 
giving a, a materialist account of origins. You had Marx with a utopian materialistic, dialectical materialist vision of the future. You had Freud giving a materialist account of human nature. Skinner, other major figures. So we've been, we have, in a sense, we're working off the intellectual capital of the late 19th century, and it's still with us, and it's, 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 it is cracking up, and it's dissipating. Um, it, it, I think many modern scientists, so, some simply are... Um, operating in that stream in a very conventional way, but others are thoughtful about it and will argue that we need the materialist methodology to make progress in science. And I think here we bear, we advocates of intelligent design, bear a, a burden of demonstration to show that uh, looking at life in a non-materialistic way as a design system can bear fruit in science. I think it can, I think it already is. And I think the history of science, interestingly, has already shown that. If you go back to the, the scientific revolution, to Kepler and Newton and Boyle and Galileo, these, these uh, early founders of modern science were operating out of an explicitly theistic framework. Newton always gets tagged as being the author of the great mechanistic universe, but his understanding of gravity was profoundly anti-materialistic. Uh, and this is the fundamental law for Newton was gravitation. He thought it was absolutely mysterious that that there would be action at a distance, that there would be a force transmitted through empty space from the, the, the Earth to the Moon, for example. And in the end, he thought that gravity was only explained as an expression of God's, quote, constant spirit action. So the, 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 the theistic view of reality that gave rise to modern science in the period we call the scientific revolution was incredibly fruitful. And I think it can be and is already, again, if we think of design as is essentially a theistic-friendly uh, construct, I think that uh, it will be heuristically fruitful and already is proving to be so. But I do take seriously the objection of our materialist colleagues who, who want to see the proof in the pudding. Thank you very much. You know, heuristically, uh, that's the magic word of the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I tell you, we could go on and on. This is, uh, this is delightful. Um, Thank you for coming. Um, trying to think um, what we have to say. First of all, uh, in just a moment, somebody's going to whisk a table or something, I think, up here. Where, does anybody know where the book signing is happening? Is there a table there already? Okay. Um, so if those of you who are interested uh, in having Dr. Meyer sign your book or the book that you're about to purchase, um, and please do. And thank you. <laughs> so thank you for coming. <laughs>